this morning. Genesis chapter 37. And by the way, I'm still sitting on a stool. Uh, won't be for too much longer. My surgery for my knee, those of you who have been asking, thank you. Those of you who have been praying, especially thank you. My surgery will be this coming up Wednesday. I don't know the time or any of that stuff yet. I'll find out tomorrow. But I would appreciate your prayers on that. Hopefully before too long, I'll be able to stand back here again. I, I have a problem locking my right knee out and putting my weight on it yet. So uh, hopefully that'll, that'll go smoothly as, as the left one did many years ago when I had that one done. So uh, be praying for me on that. I thank you for those of you who have. Genesis chapter 37. If you need a Bible this morning, you forgot yours, you want to borrow a Bible, someone standing by, keep your hand up nice and high, raise it up for them, um, and they'll bring you a Bible. Anybody at all, just keep your hand up nice and high. Genesis chapter 37. Uh, last week, I think we did all right with Genesis chapter 36. <laughs> it was a tough chapter, I got to tell you. But you know what? I think the Lord really blessed me, you know, because I spent, while I was out there in California, I read it quite a bit. I just looked at it and thought about it. And I thought about it in a sense in the presence of the Lord. And I really got a sense of the purpose of, the, of that chapter in the Word of God. You know, that is, those of you who weren't here last week, it's the genealogy of Esau. And you're like, why are we reading about Esau? But it, it, we, we saw why it was important information. Now we're beginning an important transition here in the book of Genesis. Uh, it's the fourth and final section, the final division of the book of Genesis. And we, you know, those who, who, uh, who teach the Bible, we're the ones who put the divisions in. God never put any divisions in. But for the, for the sake of argument, if you want to divide it into four sections, the life of Joseph becomes the fourth and final section, and we'll be looking at him with a brief stopover in chapter 38 about his brother Judah. Very interesting chapter, very difficult chapter. Now, I don't know whether we'll get to that next week or not. I, being I have my surgery, we'll see. But here, as we get more into the life of Joseph, we're going to see uh, what happens. And uh, it also should be noted in terms of the timing of chapter 37, we're actually going backward in time since the end of 35 and, and the beginning of 36. Uh, and, and in fact, since we know that, he, that Jacob was about 15 at the time of Rachel's death, and, and here in this chapter he's about 17, uh, we, we figure this is about two years after Jacob arrived in Hebron after having dwelt in Shechem about 10 years. So just to give you a, a sort of a picture, a snapshot of where we're at. Now, Joseph as a Bible character is very unique. And as we look at his life, we're going to see some amazing things. He's one of the greatest examples of a man who has integrity in the face of temptation, you're going to see. Very encouraging as we look at his life in that sense. Uh, faith in God when it, all, when it all seems, everything in your life seems so wrong, dreadfully wrong, and, and, and yet a man uh, who forgives, who forgives those who wronged him so badly, unjustly accused, unjustly sold into slavery, as we're going to see, betrayed beyond comprehension. Have you ever been betrayed by someone who you thought loved you, who you poured so much out? I mean, I have a story I share sometimes. There was this kid from a local town here nearby, and I was in the action sports industry repping snowboards, and, and these two young guys, and I, I come to know them through the industry, the surf, skate, and snowboard industry, and I, I, I kind of like pulled them out of drugs, pulled them out of their, their, the pit that they didn't even know they were in, and I invested money and, and time and love into these guys, and I gave them a chance to, to get involved in, this, in the industry, and, and, um, you know, I introduced them to the companies I worked for. I, I flew them to trade shows with me. And one of them, uh, behind my back, tried to steal my job. It was like one of the most horrendous experiences I've ever had in my life. That, you, that I would pour, pour out, pour out, and pour out so much and invest so much in this person. And he turned around and, and he really tried to hurt me. And I learned a lot from that. But I, I, it's nothing compared to what we're going to see Joseph experience here. And in terms, as we often talk about the Old Testament, painting pictures that happen in the New, uh, this particular section of the Bible, this last, this fourth division of the book of Genesis, is painting a picture of the life of Joseph. And it sort of portrays, as you're going to see, very clearly a picture of Christ himself in many ways. Uh, people call him a type of Christ. Now, 
Uh, I wouldn't argue with someone who doesn't, doesn't want to call him a type of Christ, and, and commentators are divided over this, and here's the reason why. If, you wanna, if you're a Bible student, you want to you wanna jot this down. Nowhere in the New Testament does anyone, any of the New Testament writers point to Joseph as a type of Christ. And since they don't, we, we never really want to be dogmatic about it. Now, is there an amazing amount of simula similarities that we see portrayed in the life of Joseph? Absolutely. In fact, uh, Pink, Arthur Pink, who loves to, to point out these kind of things, he's excellent at it, counts well over a hundred of them. Well over a hundred of them. I'm going to point out a few right now for you to give you an idea of what it is that I'm actually talking about. Joseph was betrayed by his own people, his own brothers. Jesus was portrayed by his own people, uh, betrayed. Uh, Joseph was sent out by his father to, to meet with his brethren. Uh, Jesus was sent out by his father to meet with his brethren. Uh, Joseph eventually redeems his brother, and Jesus will eventually redeem his brother. Joseph is falsely accused. Jesus is falsely accused. Joseph suffered for something he didn't do. Jesus suffered for something he didn't do. Uh, Joseph was sold into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold by his brother Judas, sold out to, you know, sold out to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and uh, given up for 30 pieces of silver. Uh, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered into the service of Pharaoh. Jesus was 30 years old when he entered into the ministry. And, and it goes on and on and on. And uh, unlike um, Jacob... Uh, Isaac and Abraham, there is no mention of sin in Joseph's life. Very interesting. Well, as we go through here, there's no direct mention of Joseph's life. Now, another interesting thing to note is we've seen in Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, we've seen these incredible mountaintop spiritual experiences where God literally speaks directly to them. Never happens in Joseph's life. Very interesting also. But yet Joseph seems to be a much better spiritual you know, person in terms of in integrity. You, Joseph seems more like the churchgoer you might expect to see today, right? A few things we might look at that say, oh, maybe he shouldn't have done that. But for the most part, Joseph is a pretty solid guy. And you wonder if maybe that's why the Lord never had to speak to him in person, as we've looked over Abraham's life and Isaac's life and Jacob's life. So anyway, as we go on... Um, you know, as I, as I pointed out, and as we look at Joseph, some will suggest that the, the sin that he is guilty of is being very prideful in the way that he reveals some dreams, as we're going to see very shortly here, to his brothers and to his father, while others defend him and just say, look, I'm j he's just telling what the dream was. He's just telling his family what the dream was. But well, you can make a case that he knew the consequences of it. So let's get into this and see what, what you guys decide to believe about Joseph. Verse 1. It says that Jacob dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. He had come to Hebron finally. He had entered the land of Canaan when he dwelt in Shechem for 10 years. You remember he wasn't supposed to stop in Shechem. In fact, when he met up with Esau, he lied to Esau and said that he would follow along shortly and be, come and dwell with Esau. He didn't do that. He went the opposite direction. He went to the north to Shechem. 15 miles north of Bethel, where he once met with God, the house of God. And he dwelt there for 10 years, and, and horrific things happened to him because of that. The Lord told him, go, go live with your family down in Hebron, and he didn't do that. And he certainly suffered a great deal because of that. Now, the reality here um, of, of what he'd done, and finally coming to Hebron, and, and ha taking so long, and, and all the sin, you're going to see that expressed here in the life of his sons as the worldliness of their minds and the way that they, they think is expressed here. But the weird thing is, this is the land of promise. Abraham was told so many years ago, I'm going to bring you to a land, leave your fathers, leave your family. I'm going to bring you to a land which you do not know, and I'm going to give you this great land, and I'm going to multiply you, and it's going to be, you know, this, this great nation is going to come from you. And Abraham lived out believing that, lived out his life believing that. Isaac lived out his life believing that that land of promise would be his, that someday they, he would obtain the land. Never, never saw it happen. Jacob never saw it happen. Never saw it happen. In fact, in Hebrews, it says this, chapter 11, verse 9, By faith he, speaking of Abraham, dwelt in the land of promise as a foreign country dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. It goes on to say in verse 13, it says this, 
These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. Now, the reason I point this out is there's an interesting correlation to you and I and to them as well, and, and that is that there's a promise that we know that we're going to inherit, yet we dwell in a land that's not ours. Amen? Someday the title deed of this earth will be returned to its rightful owner, Jesus. And for a thousand years, he'll rule and reign here on, on earth, and, uh, you know, we'll serve him here. We'll be of effective tools in his quiver, but for the meantime, we dwell in a place that's hostile to us, even though it's, it'll, it'll be God's kingdom someday, right? That's a very strange thing to do, and that's the case with Abraham and his descendants. And now it goes on to say in verse 2, this is the history of Jacob. So we're saying goodbye to Jacob here. And it says, Joseph being 17 years old, that's where we get his age from verse 2, was feeding the flock with his brothers. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Interesting that Joseph had no problem sort of tattletaling on his brothers. Now we know that his brothers are, are stepbrothers in the sense that they have the same father, but they didn't share the same mother, and, and the author points that out here. Bilhah and Zilpah were the two maids of uh, Leah and Rachel. And so we have, um, you know, this difference of, and there's this division. And, and this is why, this is another of the many reasons why polygamy is just not a good idea. And there's this animosity between these brothers and who is the rightful heir of the throne of Jacob. You'll see that played out here in this chapter very much. And so we have, um, you know, the will and the righteousness of the Father always comes before the protection of our brothers. The will and the righteousness of the Father always comes before the protection of our brothers. And that's going to be a sticking point in the older brothers. There's this tension and this anxiety. But the will of the Father has to come first. And yet we see the protection of our brothers come second. Now, verse 3, Israel loved. Now notice here they're calling Jacob Israel. He is been, his name has been changed by the Lord himself. But Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than all his children. This is a problem because he was the son of his old age. Also, he made him a tunic of many colors. Now, I'm sure you've all heard of Joseph and the Technicolor dream coat, right? You've all heard of that? Well, I'm not so sure it's as accurate a picture of what the, what the scriptures are actually saying here. Joseph was the oldest son of the woman Jacob considered his, his true wife, that is Rachel, okay? Obviously, he was the 11th of the sons, uh, if you counted Bilha, um, uh, Mil, Milha, and Leah, but uh, he was the eldest of Rachel, who was the one that Jacob truly loved, and, and so he was the favored one. Now, this, this, let's go back to this phrase here tunic of many colors. The phrase there for many colors, first of all, notice in your Bible that the word many is italicized. Is that correct? Do you guys see that in there? Is that in there for you? It's in mine. The reason it's italicized is it was added later for definition. That was not in the original text, and so the word many is added, and so really it would read a tunic of colors. That Hebrew word for colors is pasim, the word pasim, it is questionable as to its true meaning and could actually mean long sleeves or full length and not just colors. And the word many could, could be a reference to how much of it there is. There's much of it. There's actually long sleeves. Why is that significant? Well, because to have a long sleeve tunic, an outer garment in that day, meant that you were highly favored and meant that you were sort of like an overseer. A typical worker or a sheep herder or, or a typical worker would not wear a tunic of long sleeves. They would wear one with no sleeves. First of all, they were cheaper to make because they were easier to make. And secondly, you needed to have, be unencumbered in doing your work. And also, you wanted to be able to have, you know, this part of your body breathe, right, as you worked hard. But if you were an overseer, and by the way, there's an allusion to the fact that Joseph was an overseer because in the phrase in verse 2, feeding the flock, and that phrase in the Hebrew actually, there's a connotation that he was overseeing the others who were watching the flocks. 
He was the feeder of the flock in a sense that he was the boss of his older brothers. And you, you're, you're, you're building this picture as we look at this over and over and over again how the father is favoring this younger of the brothers. Um, and so the problem here is obvious. And this is not a new problem for this family. Remember? We had the same problem where, with Jacob and Esau and Isaac favoring Jacob, or Isaac favoring Esau and Rebekah favoring uh, Jacob. You remember this? One loved the other more than the other. And that created such problems and animosity in the family. And we have that manipulation that happened as a result of it. Now, you know, here it's going to express itself in, in, in different ways, but this is never a good thing. It's never a good thing. And if you have, if you're so blessed that you have more than one child, you know, let this be a lesson to every one of us. That, you know, we're not going to love them, in a sense, equally. We're going to love them differently because they're different. But, but we're not going to favor either of them or any of them in that sense. In fact, this causes me to think about those who the Lord blesses with a very special kind of a love to not only have their own kids, but also to adopt other kids. And, and to love them as their own. And I'm really blessed when I see that. You know, the Duracos, for example. I'm so blessed to see that they love the way they love their daughters. It so blesses me to see that. Kids that just get the love that they need and the protection and the care that they need. And then you have the Kiernans who don't seem to stop having kids. And God bless them also. You know, hey, bless you. I'm, I'm very content with my one. And I'm, you know, very challenged by that. But, you know, love your kids with everything you have, but show no partiality. Love them differently, but show no partiality. Be willing to go as far for every one of them as you need to go, no matter whether that's going far in a bad way or going far in a good way. And so this is the consequence of this great love bestowed upon the younger brother. Verse 4, when his brothers saw their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. They couldn't even talk to the kid. They couldn't even talk to him. And now we're going to see Joseph like throws gasoline on this fire as we go forward. When, now we don't know uh, whether or not he should have said what he's about to say. That's the, that's the part that's debatable. He has this dream. Should he have known better than say it or not? Again, it's, he could have been just saying, guys, look, I have this dream. It scared me. Tell him. We're not given any of the circumstances. Most assume that he knew better and should have never said this. Verse 5, let's look at this together. Joseph had a dream and he told it to his brothers and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I've dreamed. Now my mother would say, it, John, it's dreamt, John, it's dreamt. But hey, listen, it's the Bible, Ma, what can I tell you? You guys can argue with her. Tell me this dream which, let me tell you this dream which I dreamed. There were binding sheaves in a field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. Wow. That's pretty heavy, right? Guys, look. Dad loves me more than you. And you guys are going to worship and serve me someday. How's that sound? <laughs> Deal? Let's shake on it. I don't think so. Yeah, this is, uh, this is not page five in how to win friends and influence people. I promise you that. Now, it's interesting, the dreams, because we know that prophetically they come true, that there's a prophetic element going on here, and later on, all this stuff comes true. And what I, what I think is really cool about this is, is the dream is about sheaves, speaking about grain and, and the fields and the harvest, and, and grain would be the very thing that God uses to bring his older brothers into submission to him. Very interesting. But whoa, 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 we're not done yet. Let's go forward. Verse 8 says, And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? And so they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And yes, to, to answer your questions, brothers, yes, he will. He will have dominion over you. He will rule over you. How hard is it for us to accept sometimes when God sets someone younger than us over us? Isn't it? You ever have a younger boss? You, ever, you construction work, workers, you ever have your boss come in and say, 
Hey guys, uh, this is this is the boss now. Hey guys, uh, my daughter's taken over as construction manager. How would you like that? <laughs> you know, I don't know. This would be a tough thing for me to handle as well. But uh, you know, clearly Joseph, uh, he's 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 definitely being put in a position. And he's definitely got choices to make here. And I think he's probably, I think I probably agree with the guys that say, you know what, he should have kept these dreams to himself. Anyway, let's go forward. Then he dreamed still another dream. And he told it to his brothers and said, look, I've dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. Some people just never learn, I think. You know what I mean? Ay, ay, ay. I think, he, I think it's clear at this point that he knows that telling the second dream will definitely further aggravate his brothers. And now I think he also knows that he runs the further risk of aggravating and offending his father as well. Now, he's not going to offend his mother because she's passed away at this point, which brings up an interesting question. But, you know, he's telling this dream, and as we're going to see the interpretation, you know, the stars represent the brothers, the sun and the moon is mother and father, and it brings up this interesting question about etern eternity. What is, what is the moon then? If, the, if, if his father, if Jacob, if Israel is the sun, and, and the moon then, is, is that his biological mother? Is it maybe speaking of Leah, who's now second in command in the house, and maybe his, his new mom in a sense? I don't think so. I think it's talking about his mom, his real mom. And, and so there's, there's, there's this element of an awareness of etern an eternal life or a life after death, which I see in this verse pretty interesting. But just like Abraham favored Isaac when he allowed Ishmael to be sent away, Isaac and Rebekah, as I said before, uh, picked favorites between Esau and Jacob. And now Jacob clearly lets his older sons, his other sons, know how much he loves Joseph more. And, and, and it's not a good thing. But this dream here, as we're going to see, is repeated prophetically in Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Look, listen to this. I'll just read it for you. You don't have to turn there. Revelation 12, 1 and 2. You can read it later on your own if you'd like. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. Sounds like the beginning of Israel, right? That's what we're looking at here in Genesis chapter 37 is how Israel began. When we look at Joseph's life, it's strange because some people say, why are we looking at Joseph's life? Aren't we supposed to be following the line of the Messiah, Judah and all that? Well, well yeah, we are, but we're also following the birth of the nation of Israel, the people who were, to, who were supposed to carry the good news, the gospel of God to the whole earth. And so we're looking at the birth of a nation. We're kind of shifting and following the genealogy of the Messiah. Now we're following the promise of, of God, the covenant of God to bring forth the nation. And here, you know, in Revelation 12, it recounts the history of the birth of a nation. And it also recounts how just after this, verses 3 and 4, you go forward and you find out how Satan fell. So it's going back in history there in, in Revelation. And, in, and here in verse 10, So he told it to his father and his brothers, he goes and he tells the dream to everybody now, his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him. Notice this, though. Look at what Jacob does. His father kept the matter in mind. Kept the matter in mind. I think his father kind of sensed that God's hand was on Joseph's life. Now, you know, some of the other brothers, a couple of them, showed some signs of spiritual leadership, but you might remember how, how Reuben lost his right to be, the, you know, the in, the in, to inherit the, all the blessings of being the firstborn son because he had an incestuous relationship with, with Bilhah. You remember that, right, from, uh, from last week. And so, you know, he lost that right. You know, the, the best thing that happened to Reuben after that was he had a sandwich named after him. I like that, though. It's good. It's very good. I, I don't know. Anybody likes Rubens? The Rainbow Diner makes a great one. I really like that. I know. It was kind of bad. But I listen, I'm sorry. So I, I do think, though, that Jacob sees something in Joseph. Aside from the fact that he loves him, he sees that there's some kind of anointing there. And so, you know, he keeps the matter in mind. I think he knows something's going to happen. But, uh, you know, remember now, this, this Joseph, although there's these, these bright spots that Jacob's seeing in him, 
We, know, we have the, the, the privilege of being able to, to read about his whole life and look back and know that, that, that there's no great moments where God meets him on a mountaintop and he builds pillars and there's no visions of a ladder to heaven. There's no wrestling with God and having God touch your... There's none of that really that happens in Joseph's life in comparison to his father, his grandfather, and his great-grandfather. And I think Jacob's looking for that because Jacob knew that. Jacob had that experience, you know? Joseph never does, but, but jo it almost seems like Joseph doesn't necessarily need it. He needs to be humbled, I think. I think I could agree with that, and he will be in a big way. Verse 12, then his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. Now, you remember Shechem. Shechem is that place that represented the world, and that's when Jacob led his whole clan across the Jordan and into the promised land. They came uh, to meet with Esau some, uh, I don't know, 20 or 40 miles south of Shechem, and they met with, with Esau there, and, and they told Esau a lie and said, we'll come and we'll meet with you. You guys go ahead of us. We'll be much slower, and it'll be too hard to drive the flocks and the people. We might lose some of the people. And so then they went and they dwelt in Shechem. Now, the reason why they dwelt in Shechem, speculation, of course, but my guess is it was a fertile valley. It was a fertile valley. And as we're going to see here, the brothers are going back to Shechem to both water the sheep and the flocks and to feed them of the grassy fields because in Hebron, although the, Hebron's a valley, there's not near as much water, not near as much grassy fields. Not, so this is, you know, a, a means of bringing water to them. And so they, they take the flock up and, and this is the place, by the way, where, they, where they, they killed all the inhabitants of the land because of the rape of their sister Dinah. Devastating, devastating tragedy that happened because of them dwelling in this place where they should never have been. Verse 13, Jacob or Israel said to Joseph, are, your, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to them, now, now I'm kind of thinking, why is he doing this? He knows these brothers hate him, but this is a father thinking, I'm convinced, this is a father thinking, they're his brothers. They're not going to do anything to their, it's, it's, I know that they're, this is just sibling rivalry, you know. I, there's no way that he could do anything, but he underestimates his sons. And he never even believes that, he never even thinks for a second, even after what happens to him, never thinks for a second that they've done any harm to him, even after they do. But he said, I'm going to send you to them. Come, I'll send you to them. So he said to him, here I am. Joseph says, here I am. Okay, I'll go. Then he said, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out, to the out of the valley of Hebron, and so he went to Shechem. Now, it's interesting because before we were told, Joseph brought back word about his brothers, and it wasn't a good thing. He told them bad, told his father bad things about his brothers. And so his father's kind of sending Joseph out. Well, I know my son Joseph will tell me the truth about my sons. If they're up to no good, I'll know about it. So you kind of wonder if maybe uh, uh, Israel, maybe Jacob's not trusting his sons that much. And, and there's a lot of questions there. And so, you know, off, off Joseph goes, and, and he's going to, to, to see his brothers and to bring back word to his father. Now, verse 15, a certain man found him wandering in the fields there, and the man asked him, saying, what are you seeking? So he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. It's obvious that this man knows who, who Joseph is and knows who his brothers is, because they're obviously infamous. If, if this man's from anywhere in this area, they, they well know. It, wasn't, it was only a few years ago that, that they dwelt in this area of Shechem and they slaughtered everybody up there. So that has not been so quickly forgotten. And this man knows and he says, they've departed from here for I heard them say, let's go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now Dothan, the, the, the meaning of the word Dothan supposedly meant two cisterns, two cisterns. A cistern is a hole in the ground where uh, water would, they would, they'd gather up water. Sometimes they would hew out for themselves their own cisterns. They would dig down in the ground. Sometimes they would use an, a, a natural hole in the ground and it would be filled with water. And that would be where they would have a, a stockpile of water. Now this place, Dothan, was known for having two cisterns. So obviously you'd assume there'd be a lot of water there. Well, they get there and it, there's no water there. In fact, you're going to see that they throw their own brother down in one of these cisterns. Uh, and most people look at this, another kind of a type here is they see that the sons of Israel representing the nation of Israel as a rebellious and wandering uh, peoples. And, and what, what they will do is they'll quote Jeremiah 2.13, listen to this. For my people have committed two evils. 
They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And how fascinating that, you know, these, this typology as these sons go to Dothan looking for water instead of maybe where they should have been. Maybe they should have stayed and trusted and prayed to the Lord for water down in Hebron where they were from. But anyway, verse 18, it's all speculation, but it's interesting nonetheless. Now, when they saw him afar off, there's the brothers, they're in Dothan, and they see someone coming. And even before they came near him, they noticed that it was Joseph. And they conspired, once they noticed it was Joseph, they conspired to kill him. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. Very interesting. They, they saw him afar off, probably because of his long sleeve coat. And you know, I, I, I'm, it, that long sleeve coat might have been very colorful as well because it might have been more co obviously more costly for, for fabric to have bright colors. And, and I, I guess, it, I think it was probably both. I don't know for sure. But clearly they identified him from afar off and now they want, it, they want to kill him. They conspire in their hearts. They, they communicate amongst each other. Now the oldest brother has a responsibility here. The oldest brother has a responsibility. And when he hears of what they want to say, look at verse 21. He heard it, Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands and said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand upon him that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. Now, do you think he did the right thing? What do you think? Yes, no? Do you think he was 100% right? Do you think he was 50% right? My guess is he was on the right track, but he didn't go all the way. And, and, my, and here's, here's the reason I say that. I think the right thing would have been for him to disagree with them altogether and say, you guys are out of your minds. I'm taking Joseph now, and I'm bringing him back to our father. And I'm going to tell our father everything you just said. Who's with me? He should have put it all on the line and divided his brothers right there. Who's on my side and who's not, because I'm going back. You're going to kill him, you're going to have to kill me too. And there's a lesson in that for us also. You know, we, we can't walk the line between worldliness and, you know, one foot in the kingdom, one foot in the world. We can't do that. One foot in Shechem, one foot in Hebron. You know, and I think Reuben is weak because he's lost some of the respect of his brothers probably because of the incestuous affair he had had with his stepmom. And so, you know, he, he sort of does the right thing. He knows it's wrong to kill him, uh, but he sort of like tries to trick them and has a plan and, and you know, he doesn't, he doesn't go all the way. Verse 23, so it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers and they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors or whatever you choose to believe, long sleeves, whatever that was on him, they took and cast him into the pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. And that's why we get the idea that this pit wasn't just a pit. It was a cistern, right? So normally it would have water in it, but it was completely dry. And then how callous is this? Read the next verse. They sat down to eat a meal. Wow. You throw your younger brother in a pit and you care so little about it and it means so little to you that you sit down to eat a meal. Probably to talk about, well, how are we going to deal with this? How, what's gonna, what's, let's figure out how, but by the way, you know, we'll, we'll have some, some donuts and a cup of coffee, but let's talk about how we're going to, what are we going to say to dad, right? And they're conspiring together to, to conceal their sin. And then as they're doing that, they looked up, they lifted up their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt, no doubt to do business in Egypt. Always funny, isn't it, how the enemy's always waiting right there when you're conspiring to sin. The, always, the enemy's always right there to help you, you know? Let's take you one step further than what you had intended. Let, let, you know what? Let me help. Let, I got a better idea. And the enemy's right there. But the beautiful part about this whole passage is how God takes all this evil and he turns it around and brings great glory to himself and forges a nation from this. Absolutely brilliant how God is able to take, even, even amongst our own family, when we do bad things to each other, God is able to take that and turn around and use it to his good. I'm not giving you permission to wrong your brothers and sisters. But God is able to take even our best efforts that fall short and take them and make them 
and make them for his, use them for his glory. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites. And let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh. Well, Judah's starting to come around to Reuben's way of thinking. Let's not kill Joseph. That's a bad idea. I don't want to feel that guilt. I don't want to, I don't want to think that I was part of a conspiracy to kill my own brother. I don't want to live with that. But if we sell him into slavery, uh, at least then if somebody else kills him, it won't be our fault, you know, is what, what he's thinking. And uh, so, you know, Judah convinces the brothers and, uh, you know, and this, here's that other, uh, you know, interesting correlation. It's Judah that convinces his brothers to sell Joseph to the Ishmaelites. It was Judas that sold his brother to the Pharisees. Very interesting correlation. The same name, the same origin of his name. And as a result, his brothers listen. Verse 28. The Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Now, you might get a little confused there and say, wait a minute. Who did they sell him to, the Ishmaelites or the Midianites? And you're like, wait a minute, why are there two names there? But you have to understand that the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Midian, they, they, were, they co-mingled and cohabitated, and the same group of people were referred to by the, both names often. And here in this passage, Moses, when he, rec when he you know, records all this, he actually writes it, uh, and, and he uses both names. Very interesting that he would do that. But anyway, verse 29 Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit. So Reuben was not privy to this. Obviously, he wasn't there when all this whole deal went down. So, he, uh, you know, he, he goes back to the pit to free Joseph, and he wasn't there, and he tore his clothes, and he returned to his brothers and said, The lad is no more, and I, where shall I go? Right in this moment, Reuben, recognizing that he's the oldest son, he is responsible. I alluded to this earlier. He is responsible for Joseph's protection. Remember I talked about the will of the father, the responsibility of the oldest brother. He would be responsible. He was the one who was going to have, to have to answer to his dad. His weakness prevented him from protecting Joseph from his own brothers. His weakness. His own lack of faith and walk with the Lord is what kept him from doing the right thing. And now he's going to have to lie. It's the only thing... You know, worse than what he's already done is he's going to have to lie. In fact, in, in Genesis chapter 42, verse 18, turn there real quick with me. I'm going to read it, but turn there real quick. And we're going to wrap up. We're going to get this chapter done. But this is what eventually happens. This is very interesting. Genesis chapter 42. Because of what Reuben does here, okay, Joseph remembers that. And because of what Judah does, Joseph remembers that. Look at this. This is later on, and, and this is, you know, Many years later, Joseph is, at this point, he's risen to a, a, a position of prominency in Egypt. It says this, verse 18. Joseph said to them, he's speaking to his brothers, and they still at this point have no clue who Joseph is. He said, do this and live, for I fear God. If you are honest men, let one of your brothers be confined uh, to your prison house, but you go and carry grain for the famine of your houses, and bring your youngest brother to me, so your words will be verified, and you shall not die. And they did so. Then they said to one another, We are truly guilty concerning our brother, for we saw anguish of his soul when, when he pleaded with us, and we would not hear, therefore this distress has come upon us. We're going to get back to 22 in a second, but you hear what's going on here? Here is the ten brothers down in Egypt trying to obtain grain because of a famine back in Hebron where their father still lives. Joseph is now in a position of great promise, pro prominence in Egypt and has all this wealth of grain stored up in his storehouses because God has so blessed him. But he, and he knows these are his brothers. His brothers doesn't know it's him. And he says, you know what, guys? I'll tell you what. You, let, you can find one of your brothers here in my prison, in my jail with me, you go back and you bring back your youngest brother. Your youngest brother, he, they don't know it, but that's his little brother Ben of his same mom, his, Joseph's little brother Benjamin. And he wants to see Benjamin. He longs to see Benjamin. So he says, you guys go back. You, I'll give you some grain. Leave one of the brothers here. And look what he does. Verse 22. Reuben answered them. And by the way, it also mentions here how Joseph from the pit cried out and begged from his soul, anguish anguish. Please don't do this, brothers. Please don't do this. 
And they did it anyway. And Reuben answered them saying, Did I not speak to you saying, Do not sin against the boy, and you would not listen. Therefore behold, his blood is required. They're recognizing that all this that's going on to them is a consequence of what they did to Joseph. But they did not know that Joseph understood them, for he spoke to them through an interpreter. Very interesting. He kept his identity hidden. And he turned himself away from them and wept. And he returned to them again and talked with them. And listen, he took Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. And he let Reuben go. Because Reuben was the voice of reason, he let Reuben go. Very interesting. And Simeon he took and kept. Verse 31. So they took back to, uh, I'm sorry, back to uh, chapter 37. Nice and cool in here, right? <laughs> So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, dipped the tunic in the blood, and they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, We've found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? Absolute deception. And you get the sense by this that they couldn't even say their own brother's name. Is this your son's tunic or not? They couldn't even say his name. And you wonder if their hearts were just so hard they couldn't say it. Another interesting thing here is it says nowhere in the passage that they tore the garment or ripped it or shredded it. It just says that they dipped it in blood. And if you read in John chapter 19 about the garment which Jesus wore, the kingly garment that he wore, and the soldiers, it says the soldiers did not tear Jesus' garment and sold it as a fulfillment of prophecy in, in Psalm 22. Very interesting. Joseph's garment, Jesus' garment, not torn. Verse 33. And he, that is Israel, Jacob, recognized the garment, recognized it, and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn into pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth around his waist, and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Real quick, mention in there of daughters, plural. So apparently uh, we're not told when or how many or who, but there's more than just Dinah at this point. There's daughters. And so the family's grown. And uh, then verse 36, Now the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and a captain of the guard. Now uh, we're going to learn a lot about Potiphar uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, I'm planning, I'm fully planning you guys to teach next week. <laughs> my wife just rolled her eyes at me. Uh, I have my surgery on Wednesday. I might be up here on crutches with a brace on my knee, but if I can do it, I will. I, that's my intention. The reason for that is the following Sunday after that, we're going to have a missionary come and share. Uh, you might remember uh, Matt and Chandra. Matt and Chandra came and shared. Matt shared with us, Friedman. Uh, he's a missionary to Muslims, and so we're going to have him come and share. I saw him at the pastor's conference, and he asked to come and do that, so I, I, I'm looking forward to that. So I really don't want to miss two weeks in a row, so I'm going to try to teach next week. Anyway, if I don't, I'm sure we'll have, uh, you know, someone from the body, someone share with us. So let's all stand and pray.